I want to thank everyone for joining us for today's webcast, and I'm sorry to keep you up waiting for a few minutes. Um, today we have uh, Peter Merholz with um, Adaptive Path, and he's presenting uh, Adaptive Path Subject to Change, Creating Great Products and Services for an Uncertain World. Now, Peter is the president and one of the founders of Adaptive Path, and he's the author of the newly released book, which is also called Subject to Change. And Peter's work at Adaptive Path began with a focus on information architecture. Over time, he expanded his knowledge to include product strategy, user research, and practice development. Peter's thought leadership is demonstrated through his work, blogs, and essays for Adaptive Path, which you're probably familiar with. And if you didn't know already, you should know that Peter is the individual who coined the term blog back in 1999. Um, I had the pleasure of hearing Peter speak at the Subject to Change book launch party earlier this week, so I know that you're in for a treat. And now I'm going to turn the presentation over to Peter. Uh, hello to all out there in webcast land. I am Peter Merholtz. I'm president and one of the founders of Adaptive Path, and I'm going to be talking to you about our book, Subject to Change. This is a book that I co-wrote with three of my colleagues here at Adaptive Path, Brandon Schauer, uh, David Verba, and Todd Wilkins. And so I want to acknowledge their contributions as well. This presentation is just going to hit some of the high points that we cover in the book uh, and give you a taste of, of what to expect. So I will dive right in. So the reason we wrote this book is because it was clear that uh, there's a lot in flux in the world, in the world of business, um, in terms of how to, how to address uh, uh, the uncertainty and confusion that's currently happening. So for, we have a few examples. For example, uh, the world of media is a mess, right? You have organizations like Craigslist taking classified advertising revenue away from newspapers away from newspapers. You're having, frankly, everyone taking a piece of the ads, right, whether they're TV ads or magazine ads or, or news ads. And you have other media like blogs or YouTube taking away the audience. So you've got things like the, the media industry is in flux. Similarly, you have something like the music industry in a state of metamorphosis. Uh, in the United States, iTunes is the number one retailer. What this means is that Apple, which up until about a year ago called itself a computer company, is now the number one music retailer ahead of people like Walmart and Best Buy, what we typically consider uh, music retailers. And the record labels are losing their grip. Uh, we have an image here of Jay-Z who, instead of signing with the record label, has signed with Live Nation, which is a concert promotion uh, venue, and they're going to be handling uh, the entirety of his musical uh, output and career. Same thing with, with Madonna, so we're seeing artists moving away from recording labels and towards uh, these concert promotions. And uh, another example, the travel industry is turbulent. Now, we already know that with respect to things like booking travel, where travel agents have pretty much uh, gone away in favor of sites like Orbitz or Expedia. But we're also now seeing that the experience of travel flying with the airlines is, is in a state of interesting flux, where at least in the United States, the cheapest airlines are the ones that produce the best experiences, provide the most quality. So it's, it's not simply a matter of paying more is what gets you a better experience. You, you pay less on Southwest or JetBlue, but you actually enjoy that flight better. So, so there's, this, there's this, definitely this, this turbulence, this, this uncertainty that's happening in the market. And, and this is what we wanted to respond to with the book because predicting the future has never been easy, but it also at this point has never been more difficult. So what we know is that predicting the future won't work. <clears throat> you, you can't really say where we're going to be in five to ten years and just plan to get there. That, that won't work. Um, meeting about it won't work. Sitting in conference rooms uh, talking about it won't work. What we argue that works is to adopt approaches that will allow you to succeed no matter which future comes to pass. You want to set your organization up to be adaptive and adaptable to whatever happens. And that's what we propose uh, in our book, Subject to Change. So we uh, now moving on to a brief history lesson that we think sheds some interesting light on this situation. In 1883, uh, this was the state of photography, this, this camera on the left. In fact, this camera on the left was the leading edge of photography. There was, there was no better uh, uh, camera out there. 
But uh, this is the article that went, or this is the text that went with this photo. Uh, there are no less than 17 different parts that you have to pay attention to in order to simply take a picture. And what this meant is that at the time, photography was really only accessible to either professionals or, or ardent hobbyists. But there was a man who had a vision. George Eastman had this idea for a camera where all that you need to do is press the button, and we, his company, will do the rest. That camera was the, Co the original Kodak camera, which spawned the Eastman Kodak empire, which dominated photography for over 100 years. And what he realized is that instead of having people need to engage in 17 steps in order to take a picture, just have them engage in three. Pull the cord, turn the key, press the button. He was able to simplify the experience of photography so that it was no longer simply accessible to professionals, but to anybody who, who wanted to take a picture. And the genius in that wasn't simply, wasn't making a simpler camera. That was part of it. But you still have all that complexity of printing and developing and processing film. So the genius was in um, turning a product, this Kodak camera, into a service. With the product, you press the button. With the service, Eastman Kodak, this is an image of the Eastman Kodak factory in Rochester, New York, uh, in the 1880s. Um, through the service, they do the rest. And what he realized is you need to stop thinking about your products as products, as these standalone entities that you put into the world. And instead, you need to think about them as touch points, as entry points into a system, uh, into a, uh, which, prov which can uh, provide a service. And what this actually does is this um, extends the relationship that Kodak now has with its customers. It's not simply going to a store and buying a camera, because every time you wanted to get your uh, pictures developed and printed, you're in, once again re-engaging with Kodak. So you, you develop this longer-term relationship with them as a service. Now, this story is important because uh, for a number of years, Kodak had this focus on customer experience, and it's what made them successful. And in more recent years, the reason that they failed, the reason that they've stumbled is because they lost, uh, they lost sight of that focus. They got too caught up in chasing the revenue, which was in the paper processing. And when the digital revolution came, Kodak actually had in their R&D labs, they had done a lot of interesting work with digital, but the business couldn't imagine moving to digital because the share of their profits were coming from paper. And so they were unable to sh transition with the audience, with their customers. And that has led to them be, being essentially um, an also-ran in the digital uh, photography market, whereas they were easily the world leader when it came to film photography. So one of the things that's important to keep in mind as we're thinking about the development of products, and I'm guessing this being an O'Reilly-oriented audience, this diagram will be somewhat familiar because it's typically it's, it's one of the ways to think about software, think about software development. And typically those of us who are involved in the development of software products think about it in, in a way similar to this. You, you, at your core, you have data. You have the, material, the raw material that people are going to be engaging with. You wrap that with some logic, with some programming, uh, so that you can do interesting things with that data. And then you provide a user interface that allows access uh, to the logic and then to the data. Now, uh, those of us who, who build software systems, we understand this. What we have to keep in mind, though, is that our audience doesn't think about it this way at all. Our audience thinks about it in one way. There's the user interface. There's that which they see and engage with. And then everything else behind it is magic. Right? It's, it's pulling rabbits out of hats. They don't know how it works. They don't want to know how it works. And they don't need to know how it works. And the problem is we oftentimes in our product development, we design from the inside out. We start with the data that we have, and we work our way out to an interface that allows people access to the data. And what we need to do, we need to invert that. We need to start with the experience that people want to have, that interface, and figure out what that means in terms of what is the logic and then what is the data that drives this. Um, Tim O'Reilly actually had a, 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 a way of, a, a, a term for this approach, which is designing from the outside in. 
Uh, and that's what we're arguing with, with the book, is that we need to take a more outside-in approach to building products and services and to recognize that the experience is the product that we are delivering. The product is not the product we're delivering. The product is a way to get to the experience, but we need to be thinking about what is that whole experience that people are engaging with and how do, how do we deliver that, whether it's through a product, through a service, or a combination. So for the next uh, half an hour or so, I'm going to be talking about, uh, a, we have a set of topics that I'll be focusing on uh, to, to address this point. Uh, uh, these four, we want to focus on experience, we want to focus on the lives of our customers, we want to embrace the complexity uh, that exists in the world. We don't want to simply uh, remove it, but we need to figure out how to take advantage of it. And we want to um, engage in design, think about engaging in design as an activity. So re recognizing that uh, design is something that everyone can do. And so to begin with, by focusing on experience, what we're arguing is that it's time for companies to start using experience as a strategy, not just simply uh, market research and, and, and uh, spreadsheet number crunching as a strategy, but really think about how experience can drive strategy. So what do we mean when we say experience strategy? Well, uh, think about the original Palm Pilot when that came out, that actually came out after there had been other personal digital assistants, uh, uh, one from Tandy uh, called the Zoomer and one from uh, famously Apple's uh, Newton Message Pen. Now, what Palm was able to do is actually have an experience strategy around it, unlike the Newton, which pretty much tried to cram an entire PC into a handheld device uh, uh, and really not make any, make any smart decisions about what it should or shouldn't be. The Palm really tried to figure out what, at its essence, uh, do people need from a PDA. And so when Jeff Hawkins, the inventor of the Palm, uh, sat down to think about how to develop it, uh, he started with a set of criteria that were going to drive the Palm. It needed to fit in a shirt pocket. It needed to be fast and easy to use. It needed to easily sync with a PC, and it needed to cost less than $300. So he started with those criteria, and those were the decision points that allowed, uh, those were the things that allowed him to make decisions all along the way. So, for example, he wanted it to fit in a shirt pocket. So what he did is he actually carved a block of wood that was about uh, a size that would fit in a shirt pocket, and he carried that around with him. Uh, and when people would say something to him, like say, you know, let's set up a, a, an appointment for a meeting, he would take out a block, this block of wood, and mime using a calendar function to enter it in there. And what that block of wood did is really force simplicity. It forced people to not keep loading this device with features. The Palm Pilot could have could have had as many features as the Newton Message Pad, but then it would have been confusing to use, it would have been overbearing, it would have been really difficult. What he decided to do was pare that down and focus on the essential things that people wanted to uh, be able to do with such a device. I also think it's important to keep in mind that he had that $299 uh, price point in mind. He recognized that in order for this to succeed as a, a general kind of consumer device, I mean, yes, business people would use it, but they would be buying it for themselves probably, it had to have a price point that made it readily affordable, and that also enforced uh, some, uh, that constraint enforced simplicity. So, so it's important to go into product, de uh, product development process with a clear idea of that experience you want to deliver, and then figure out the technologies that will enable it. Another experience strategy is this advertising slogan from George Eastman, you press the button, we do the rest. That, that provides a focus for all the work that Kodak was doing. If they required customers to do anything more than simply press a button, they were off base. So that, uh, uh, this slogan allowed them to keep focusing uh, what they were doing with their product development and deliver products that people loved. Now, um, in the web world, uh, an example that we love is the Google Calendar. Uh, when Google Calendar originally came out, it actually wasn't given a lot of uh, uh, much of a chance to do to do great things in the market, and that's because at the time it was considered that calendaring web calendar applications were essentially tied to the success of 
web email applications. And so Yahoo uh, had the most popular uh, web mail application and they had the most popular calendar application. Hotmail was the second most popular uh, web mail application, so MSN's calendar was the second most popular uh, 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 web calendar application. And what Google realized, and, and, and Gmail, uh, even though it's quite popular, is nowhere near as popular. It's a distant third or fourth. So what Google realized, though, is that there was an opportunity to do something fundamentally different with their web calendar. Instead of just treating it as boxes on a screen, they could create a calendar um, that, that really worked for its users. And so the first thing they did before they drew any screens, before they wrote any code, they went out, they talked to potential users, not too many, 8 to 12, and they distilled those conversations into this vision that you see here on this slide. And this slide actually comes from a presentation given by the original product manager of Google Calendar, Carl Siogre. And that first bullet point is actually the, the most, the first four bullet points there are the most important ones. They set out to build a calendar that works for you, that's fast, visually appealing, joys to use, drop dead simple, more than just boxes on a screen, but that it really kind of ties into the rest of your life with reminders and invitations and also making it easy to share so you can see your whole life in one place and so your uh, family uh, uh, can add things or whatever to really make it integrated. So again, before they did any design, they had a strategy they, uh, based on the experience that they wanted people to have. What that allowed them to do, and, and this um, uh, data is uh, unfortunately a little bit old. It's hard to get uh, up-to-date data, but it's still interesting. After the first eight months after launch, Google is that red line that starts from zero. After the first eight months after launch, Google went from zero to being the number two web calendar, uh, second only to Yahoo. They actually surpassed MSN's calendar. And um, uh, we're certain it's because they, they reconsidered the experience that people would have with calendars, and so that even people who don't use Gmail might use Google Calendar because it's so good. Something else, uh, another service that I'm sure m everybody on the phone is familiar with is Flickr. And Flickr, you know, it has been phenomenally successful uh, uh, on magazine covers. They were acquired by Yahoo. Yahoo actually shut down Yahoo Photos and rolled uh, all of their Yahoo Photos work into Flickr. So, so Flickr has proven phenomenally successful. Flickr has an ex strategy. If you go to flickr.com slash about, as you're shown here, you actually, they, they've written down what it is that they're about, why they exist. And I'm going to actually play a little movie that allows you to see that full page. Um, so Flickr has these two goals. We want to help people make their content available to the people who matter to them in any way possible. And they want to enable ways, new ways of organizing photos. So this, these were the experiences they wanted to deliver. And all of the product decisions that they have made since then simply come out of this desire to deliver on these two, these two experiential goals. So the question that you have to ask yourself as you're doing product development, as you're doing design and development of anything, whether it's a website, uh, a piece of software, or a physical product, do you have that North Star? By North Star, do you have that, that, that point on the horizon that you're aiming towards? Uh, you press the button, we do the rest, is that North Star that, that guided the development. That vision from Google Calendar was that North Star that guided that development. Do you have that uh, uh, point on the horizon to orient yourself to, around and towards so that you know the goal, you know what it will take to succeed? So getting back to this idea that the experience is the product. Um, we've talked about focusing on experience. The next thing you need to do is focus on the lives of your customers. Your products are meaningless if you don't pay attention to customers. And the, the challenge here is to truly understand people as people. Uh, too often businesses understand people as something not quite as people, and, and I'll explain what I mean in a moment. Now, too often uh, people approach doing kind of customer research in, in a way that's uh, similar to uh, uh, Jacques Cousteau, or here we have this image of Steve Zissou, but in that way that's similar to Jacques Cousteau under the sea, but in this, he's in this uh, pod 
where he's safe and he's not really engaged with the creatures around him. And when we talk about customer research, we want to avoid these types of methodologies, things like focus groups, where you put everybody in a room and you're behind uh, a, a piece of glass that allows you to see in but doesn't allow them to see you. That's exactly not the right way to do it. You need to start embedding yourselves with the people who are using your products and really understand what it is that matters to them. Organizations tend to oversimplify their view of people. There's, there's obviously businesses realize they have customers and they have to serve those customers in some way. But when they think about their customers, they tend to think about them in, in simplistic ways. So here are four kind of old ways of thinking about customers. Probably the worst is uh, the customer as consumer. And the customer as consumer is kind of summed up in this quote, uh, a gullet whose only purpose in life is to gulp products and crap cash. You just try to shove as many products at them, try to get them to spend their money, and hope that they just keep, keep throwing money at you, and you don't see them anymore as, any, as anything other than a wallet. That is, that is the, the worst way to think about your, your customer. Um, a slightly more elevated view of the customer is this idea of the homo economicus, right? And this comes from kind of standard economic theory and what is taught in a lot of business schools, uh, where the customers are highly rational, they want to maximize utility, they want to get the most for their money in terms of quantity. Um, the problem is uh, the only people who kind of into this mode are, are Vulcans, right? Humans don't behave rationally in this way. Humans are messy and emotional creatures, and we need to take that into account as we think about the products and services that we deliver. So um, uh, similarly, another view, perhaps, perhaps the most enlightened view uh, that companies have of, of customers, um, and you see this a lot in companies that practice user-centered design, right? So a lot of software firms think about customers in this way, which is customers are task-oriented, goal-driven, and they want to be efficient, right? Uh, we want to make our software product such that they can complete this task in two minutes instead of five, or in one step instead of three. And there's some value to this, but it, what it ends up doing is it ends up reducing uh, customers to robots, these kind of type A personalities who are all about efficiency and about productivity and about getting stuff done. And People, that's not always their primary goal, is, is, is not always one of efficiency or productivity. Um, and it, we have to start considering emotion. Now, the challenge when considering emotion is this last, uh, this last uh, uh, way of thinking about customers, which is that um, customers can be very docile and gullible. And uh, this is a very kind of marketing-driven approach here, right? So if customers are docile and gullible, all we need to do is create the right story, create the right TV ad, create the right messaging, and they will follow us like sheep. And they will do what we tell them because we've told them a story that, that tugs at their heartstrings. And it doesn't matter how, how good or bad the product is, if we tell the right story, customers will be there. And perhaps for some very simple products like beer and shaving cream, you can use this approach. But for the more complex products that we're trying to engage customers in, it's, it's not enough. Now, um, these four kind of archetypes of customers are not wrong, right? People do respond to stories, and, and they have that emotional orientation. People are trying to get stuff done and be productive. People do think you know, about how to get the most bang for their buck. They don't want to just throw money away. Um, that first one might not be right at all in terms of gullets that uh, 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 buy products and crap cash. But, but there's something, you know, there is something to each of these that um, is, it has, there, there's a ring of truth to each of these, but they're not, they're not complete. And so what we need to do is start evolving our approaches to understanding people. And what's been missing in most of the ways that we understand people is this understanding of the messy, messy complexity of human life. We need to think about uh, our customers the way we think about ourselves. If you think about your day so far, if you think about the people in your life, the people you've interacted with, the challenges uh, that you might have faced today or the joy that you might have already experienced today, it was probably pretty messy. You might have missed uh, uh, the bus, you might have got stuck in traffic, or it might have been a breeze, and you might have got a parking space, or you might not have gotten that parking space. Or when you stepped into the office, someone might have said something to you uh, that, that 
uh, threw you off your day and you couldn't go to that first meeting. There's, there's complexity happens in life, and we need to start recognizing that and, to, and, and taking that into account in the work that we do. Um, you know, so, for example, people regularly mix and match products with little regard for suggested use, right? We have these, these instruction manuals that tell people what to do, but as any software developer knows, uh, no one actually reads the manual and they'll try to figure out how to make the product work for themselves. So we have a couple of kind of funny examples here of, of attaching a, a, a Swiffer head to a, a radio-controlled car to, to, to clean the floor, or uh, this is a dunking of a donut, a Krispy Kreme donut, in a pint of Guinness, because you know what? Some people think that tastes great. So, so people are going to do strange things with your products, and you have to take advantage of that. People will challenge social and cultural boundaries in unexpected ways. They'll, they'll write marriage proposals on freeway overpasses, right? So we have to, we have to take into account the, the, the way that people actually are, and we have to understand people as people. In other words, understand them as we understand ourselves, our friends, our family. So what's been missing in our approaches is a real understanding of emotions, of the context in which people work, and of the meaning that people are seeking in their lives. Uh, this is a quote from Don Norman, who wrote uh, the book Emotional Design. And, you know, he, he finally wrote this book after 20 years of doing user-centered design and kind of being somewhat dismissive of emotion as a factor in, in product design. He wrote this book because he now recognized that new scientific advances in our understanding of the brain and of how emotion and our cognition are thoroughly intertwined. We scientists now understand how important emotion is to everyday life, how valuable. So, so cognitive science has been able to um, uh, study emotion, and, and Don felt it was time to write the book. But if you read the book, Don actually begins with an experience that demonstrates he knew that emotion has been important for 20 years, but he wasn't confident enough uh, uh, in that understanding to, to lead with it. Because Don tells this story of back at Apple, uh, he had a black and white Mac. And, you know, they had done studies, and they'd shown that people were very productive on these, uh, using a black and white screen. But color monitors were starting to come out. And so he wanted to do a study to get a sense of how the, uh, does, does, do people per, uh, perform better using a color monitor instead of a black and white monitor? Do they complete their tasks more quickly? Do they, um, uh, uh, are they more successful? Uh, are they more productive? So they did some studies. They gave, he gave himself a color monitor. He gave other people color monitors. They did the studies, and what they found out is no people are just as successful uh, and as productive using a black and white monitor as using a color monitor. So three or four months pass after the study, and um, someone from uh, the, the uh, facilities at Apple comes to Don and says, okay, we need to take that color monitor back now. And he says, not on your life. He rec and, and, he, and, uh, and that kind of surprised him, but he had grown attached color. He realized he liked color. It pleased him. It made him feel better. It made him happier. There was no way he was going to give up that color monitor, even though uh, he knew rationally it didn't make him any more productive. Uh, he knew emotionally that it, that it made work more pleasing. So we have to understand emotion. We have to start taking that into account. We have to shift away from thinking about tasks, goals, preferences, and towards thinking about emotions context and meaning in order to really understand <clears throat> excuse me in order to really understand people as people we have to to change the size and shape of our re research filters to make sure that more and better information gets through the sifting process when we do talk to users and study our customers we need to to do it in new ways that allow for a more complete understanding so the question that we leave you with is do you understand your customers as as real people. So we also need to embrace complexity. And the way to do that is to think about systems that support experiences instead of just thinking about one-off products. So what do we mean by this? Experiences don't match your organization, right? Uh, this is an, an example we like from uh, the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Farm Service Agency. Who knows? You know, this is a government organization, probably a very Byzantine organizational structure. Um, but and, and this is a website for people to uh, market 
uh, sell and trade hay. So kind of you can think about it as kind of eBay for hay. Um, and what they recognized is that they have a for, they have a, a luxury in that their customers really only fall into two groups: those that need hay and those that have hay. And the the, the organization is structured that way. Uh, uh, but they were you know they're able to provide a very simple uh, uh, entry point into their service. Unfortunately, or, uh, as most I'm, most of you know, if you think about most of the websites, many of the websites you look at, they're structured the way organizations are structured. The problem is people don't engage with organizations based on that organizational structure. So we have an example here from a project that we did at Adaptive Path with the financial institution, where we went into people's homes, we conducted a lot of research, and we realized all these different touch points that customers had with our client, whether it was the monthly statement they got, whether it was using a telephone to call the call center, uh, print collateral that they received, a financial advisor that they worked with, or a website that they engaged with, right? People's experiences cross these, uh, 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 cross all these different touch points. Um, the problem was the organization wasn't set up to handle it. So the people who worked on the web didn't interact with the people who worked on the phone, who didn't interact with the team that uh, created the monthly statements that got mailed out. And so when there were problems in the experience, there wasn't a holistic way of rectifying it. And so, you know, we were hired to work on the website design. And what we recognized, though, is if they didn't fix the, the monthly statement, this 20-page statement that overwhelmed people, if they didn't improve the experience that people had calling the call center, it almost didn't matter how good the website was because people would um, uh, people would be so frustrated with this organization because of those other elements of the experience. And so what we need to do is think about how to deliver uh, an experience that crosses these boundaries and how to think systematically and systemically about the experiences that we deliver and coordinate across these different touch points. And you know, the, there are ways to embrace this complexity. Um, one thing is to, take, is to have iterative approaches, right? Uh, uh, try little things and keep revving them. Don't, don't do these you know, one or two year long releases and hope that that solves all problems, but, but be nimble through iterative approaches. You also need to start getting very comfortable uh, with prototyping and actually making things, uh, and making things that you'll throw away. So this uh, image comes from the design from IDEO. They were working on a medical device product and at some of the initial meetings, they were just trying to get a sense of how big could this thing be and how might it feel in the hand. And so they just looked around the office and they grabbed uh, a dry erase marker, a film canister, and kind of a, looks like a chip clip, taped it all together and got a sense of, does this feel about right? And what that allows you to do is very quickly get to certain key factors uh, about, you know, is it handheld? If it is, what, what, what is the form factor? So one way to embrace these complex systems is to, is to start making things that people can start in, engaging with immediately. And it's crucial that uh, we collaborate um, uh, deeply and widely throughout an organization. We can't get caught up in our particular organizational silo. We need to get uh, people um, from across the organization as well as um, all the way, you know, as, as, as high up as you can go in an organization, you know, to the executive level and as far down as you can go into an organization to, you know, people working on a factory floor or in a distribution channel or, or answering, you know, customer service on the phone because all of these people are responsible in some way for the, that experience that we're delivering. And we need to make sure that they all understand uh, uh, what it is that we're trying to do. Um, uh, uh, this example, you know, you have on the left, you have a pedometer, uh, uh, you know, uh, and, you know, uh, a new model pedometer, digital, uh, uh, you know, you, it does a lot of uh, smart things. And on the right, you have the symbol for the uh, Nike plus iPod system that they developed, right? And um, what, what happens too often is uh, organizations, uh, the way they embrace the complexity is they try to cram all the, all the complexity into a single product up front. And so you get something like this pedometer on the left, which is really complicated to use. It doesn't make sense. There's, gonna, there's too many buttons and knobs and dials and features. I mean, 
can even think about a, a stopwatch and how complicated those have gotten, right? Whereas um, what, what the Nike Plus iPod system has realized is that it's trying to, instead of trying to engage with complexity all at once up front, if you have your complexity play out over time, you can use that to your advantage and unfold these new experiences over time. And I'll be getting into this in more detail later, how, how the Nike Plus iPod system does it, but, but in, in one way to embrace complexity is to not shove it all in at once, but to figure out how you can stage that complexity so that it reveals itself over time. So uh, we're going to, I'm going to actually probably have to skip ahead because I'm seeing that uh, uh, in order to take, have some time for some questions, I'm not going to be able to play this movie. But what I have here is a movie um, that essentially tells, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the story, but it essentially tells the story of the Target uh, pill bottle system, uh, the new Target Clear, R, Clear RX system which was created by uh, uh, Deborah Adler, who you see uh, here in this image. She, um, uh, uh, she decided to redesign the pill bottle because her grandparents, one of her, I think it was her grandmother, took the wrong medication by mistake because pill bottles all look the same. Uh, uh, her grandmother grabbed her grandparents' medication and because they actually have very similar names, they have the same last name, of course, and their first names both begin with H-E. I think she's Henrietta and he's Herman. So he, you know, she took the wrong medicine by mistake. It turns out a lot of people do this, this 60% number here. A lot of people take the wrong medicine by mistake. So what she decided to do, she was a graphic designer. She said, this is a problem I can address through design. And so what she ended up doing is redesigning the pill bottle in such a way that it was easier to read, more legible, um, uh, used graphic design to communicate a hierarchy, used color coding on these rings around the, the neck of the bottle so that you could immediately identify by color which bottle was yours. And um, Target recognized that this would be great for them because it would, it would play into their uh, design, their, 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 their brand uh, positioning all around design, and allow them to um, really stand out as a different kind of uh, company with their pharmacy. Target had a pharmacy, and this really allowed their pharmacy to stand different from all the others. Now, in order to make the pill bottle work, uh, what this uh, illustration here on this slide shows is that it required a, a lot of uh, uh, a lot of elements to orient themselves to deliver on this vision of a, of a clearer, simpler pill bottle. They had to get their CRM, their supply chain, their point of sale systems. They had to train people, both pharmacists well as the marketers, they had to marshal um, uh, a lot of resources to create a system, the end product of which was this new pill bottle. But uh, uh, it, it's proven extremely valuable. The, the target pharmacy has proven extremely uh, successful. So what you need to ask yourself is, given this complexity, what are you doing to harness change in your organization? Um, the last thing to, that we want to make sure that is uh, that you understand about what we're trying to get across in the book is that um, design needs to become an organizational competency. Um, there are five ways of thinking about design, and the first four of these are, are the typical ways that people think about design. So design is aesthetics. It's often thought of that design is just styling. Or maybe design as a distinct role. Design is something that somebody else does, probably someone with you know cool shoes, blue hair, and a black turtleneck. Maybe uh, you, you think of design as a thing, right? The purpose of design is to create an artifact that will go in a museum, uh, uh, you know, be shown at, at the MoMA in, in New York. And, or maybe, you know, of late we're hearing a lot about design as a rock star, design as savior, the power of design. It's on the cover of Business Week, this idea that design uh, is, is what's going to, is, is the savior to, to help your business. Now, Kind of like when we were talking about uh, the different types of customers, these aren't all wrong, but they're not all really right, because design is is more than this. And what we argue for in the book is a is a fifth way of thinking about design, and that's simply design as an activity, design as an activity that everyone can embrace, that everyone can engage in within an organization, and that the role of designers are more as facilitators of getting marketers and technologists and business analysts uh, and customer service representatives 
getting them to start designing, we as designers, our responsibility is to facilitate those, the, getting those ideas out of people's heads and helping hone those ideas and turn them into um, a, a, a service or a product. Um, so design needs to be thought of not as a special practice that only special people can engage in, uh, can engage in but as an activity that everyone can be involved in. And so one way of thinking about this, um, uh, or another way of thinking about how to embed design in your organization is to think about customer loyalty. Typically, businesses think about customer loyalty through loyalty programs. You know, you're a, you know, uh, I am a premier executive on United, or uh, you have a gold or platinum uh, a card through your uh, credit card company, right? And they think that customer loyalty can simply be done through these programs. Um, and, you know, 75% of consumers have, have loyalty cards, but uh, we, we like this quote, if you want loyalty, get a dog. Uh, the, the, the way to get loyalty is not through uh, uh, these, these marketing programs to encourage loyalty, but instead to, to recognize that there's more uh, uh, to the service that you're delivering to that, that can make people truly love you. And so there's this line from The Grinch that sold Christmas. Christmas isn't something you buy from a store. Christmas perhaps means a little bit more. So meaning more means repeatedly creating great experiences. Loyalty, which is what then in turn spawns word of mouth, evolves from creating a great experience um, and, and that great experience that I as a customer have with the company over time. And one way that we think about delivering these great experiences is by delivering these moments of wow, what we call the long wow. And uh, it's similar to what we were talking about earlier in terms of embracing complexity. You want to take that complexity and create a pipeline of wow moments that can be uh, uh, introduced over time. So if we think about um, the Nike plus iPod example, instead of having everything just uh, packed into a pedometer by having it so that you have this system where you have an iPod that uh, works with your running shoes and then you can plug that iPod into your desktop, you can all of a sudden uh, start using a website that helps you track your run or plan a run. Um, you can see how you've done uh, over time, right? You can compare your uh, time, uh, uh, what you've done today with what you've done in the past. You can plot it so you can see the routes that you've taken, right? So you can start uh, uh, creating this wow experience of, of uh, thinking what you're doing uh, uh, with others. Um, you can uh, use uh, the iPod to time a song. So uh, perhaps uh, um, the eye of the tiger, right, is what really gets me going. When I'm about to start fading, right, if I know that on the, every time on that fourth mile I start I start fading, I can have my power song kick in, and that can give me a boost that can help me carry through, right? So that's another part of this wow experience uh, that, that is being delivered. When I, when I sync it, uh, I, can, I can sync it with, uh, I can have a running group that I'm with, and there's four of us who are competing with one another, say, right? So now it's not just about me, but it becomes the social activity. And it's uh, no matter where I'm running, I'm also running with other people. So, so this collaborative running now provides a wow experience, right? And you know, it now starts connecting to these bigger events that Nike can put on, uh, 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 you know, these national events that are now networked, where you're running against kind of everybody at these things. So, so you have the set of products, right? The running shoes, the nano, the music, the pedometer, the website, and tracking tools, which uh, in turn produce a set of these wow experiences, feedback, running events, collaborative running, power songs, sport eye mixes, all of which, uh, desktop widgets, all of which can lead to this uh, long wow experience that you've now had where, where every time you use this tool, something new that's really exciting happens. And what, they, what, what um, Nike and iPod can do is continually deliver. They can keep adding new things to it over time to, to um, once you've had these six or seven moments of wow, they can release an eighth and a ninth and a tenth. It's, it's this platform that allows them to continue to create and innovate. So the challenge for you is to think about, are you building a platform that can create these wow moments over a long haul? Uh, 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 are you doing something that allows you to continue to repeatedly impress and delight your uh, customers, 
or are you simply launching something and then just moving on to whatever's the next thing? We need to think about what we're releasing, the products that we're releasing as these services that people are having relationships with that are building over time. So these are the four points that we touched on. Focus on experience, focus on the lives of customers, embrace the complexity, engage in design as activity. Um, these all come from the book, and the goals of the book are to really articulate a new approach to creating products and services in an uncertain world and address a gaping hole in how companies serve people. I want to leave you with one last point. There was some research that was done by uh, Bain, the management consulting firm, where they asked 362 companies, are they customer-focused? 95% said they were customer-focused. 80% of those companies said they delivered a superior experience. However, if you asked those firms' customers whether or not they agreed um, that those companies delivered a superior experience, only 8% said that these companies were delivering a, a superior experience. That means that 72% that there's the 72% of companies that say they're delivering a super, superior experience, but their customers don't think they are. And uh, they think they're delivering a superior experience because they have some of those outmoded ways of thinking about customers and loyalty. And what they need to start doing is embracing these new ways of thinking about customers and loyalty. So, do you want to be uh, you want to be part of that eight percent? But what we really want to do with this book is turn that eight percent into something more. So, just uh, ending with a little blurb about the book. Subject to change, Don Norman, who we quoted before, we. Uh, gave him a copy of the book early, and uh, uh, he told us that he found it short but powerful, easy to read yet profound. I've been searching for just this book, the one perfect book that summarizes the essence of modern product design. He teaches a class at Northwestern University, and he's going to make this mandatory reading for his students, which makes us proud. So with that, I thank you. Uh, some photo hey, credits. Peter. And I'll, we can leave this slide up. Hi. Hey, are you there? I am here. Can you hear me? I can hear you perfectly. I, I didn't want to interrupt. That was a great presentation. I could listen to you talk about this forever. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you enjoyed it. I, uh, uh, as is typical, I always have a little bit more than I uh, have time for, so I hope I didn't leave out too much. Well, do you have, do you have time for a few uh, questions if people have them I haven't seen, I do I, think I have as much them. time I have as much time as you'd like me to have should I pull up that chat window or do you want to just read well we haven't had here? any yet I think everyone was uh, engrossed in your presentation but uh, <laughs> people listening if you have uh, questions uh, submit them now we've heard this was great a oh, wow indeed <laughs> so um, any questions from the audience are there any other oh I see that qu that question for the audience wasn't really for me um, <laughs> oh, someone, someone was someone asking asked about, about you, uh, uh, these recorded sessions. Let me cursor yeah. off, but I didn't want to interrupt you because um, I've had that myself. So, any questions, people? Should a because product contain many experience life cycles? Um, well, I mean, uh, trying to think how the best way to, to, to answer that question. Um, a product... Um, it's interesting. If you, you know, we, we, we made a point of trying to avoid talking too much about Apple uh, in this presentation because they've become almost a cliche. But um, if you think about uh, a product with experience life cycles, I mean, we do talk about the Nike plus iPod, though that's actually more driven by Nike than it is by Apple in terms of all the services around it. But um, if you think about something like the iPhone, um, uh, that can contain many experience life cycles because it's this blank slate. So in June, next month when they release iPhone 2.0, I don't have to buy a new iPhone. Um, I might have to pay to upgrade to a new operating system the same way I do if I buy a new operating system for my Macintosh, but I don't have to buy a new iPhone. And so I think, that's an, I think we're going to see a shift towards um, uh, if you have a platform, you are going to have to be thinking about experience life cycles. And you're going to have to be thinking about um, how, how you can release these things over time uh, and possibly whole new experiences over time. Uh, any other historical examples beyond Kodak? Well, Kodak is one of our favorites because it happened so long ago. It was over 100 years ago. Uh, and, no one, and, and what shocked us is how for 100 years people kind of didn't pay attention. And we had this very top-down manufacturing view of products 
that, that was successful, but once products started getting complex again with putting microchips in products and, and, and putting software in products, that, that top-down manufacturing view started to go away. The other examples that we tend to talk about when we talk about this, one of them we mentioned was the Palm Pilot, which is, I don't know if it's historical, it's, it's you know, 15 years old now, where uh, Jeff Hawkins explicitly decided to no longer uh, to not chase after to not to be to chase after features and, and do the feature parody thing that, that so many technology firms try to do, but really focus on the, the essence of what people are wanting to do. And there's actually uh, a, 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 a term that the people at Palm had, which was the Zen of Palm, which was this idea that um, there was a limit to how many features people comfortably could engage in in a mobile device, and that the per the point wasn't to keep packing more features in but was to find that sweet spot. And, you know, if you compare Palm to uh, the, the message pad or other PDAs, it did less, uh, uh, it did fewer things, but it was more successful. Similarly, if you compare the original Apple iPod, it wasn't the only uh, uh, MP3 playing jukebox at the time. MP3 players had been around for three or four years, and jukeboxes, there was actually a jukebox uh, built by Compaq that had predated the iPod. So the iPod, though, did less than those other things did, because uh, all of those other things allowed you to manage your playlists and to delete songs and all of that on the device. What Apple realized is um, you could do all those things using iTunes and make the device really simple. Uh, the other example that we often use uh, is the Nintendo Wii. So whereas Microsoft and Sony decided to, to uh, play the... Um, the, the, the power wars, right? We're going to put more polygons and faster processors and more and more and more of those things that we had been doing uh, up until now. Nintendo, which in the prior generation had um, not done very well with the GameCube, so with the, the Nintendo's GameCube tried to play that fight in the prior war, and they realized they, they weren't, that's not where their heart was. So Nintendo instead has a device that has far less power than uh, the Xbox 360 or the PS3, right? It doesn't have ne nowhere near as good graphics, but they recognize they could introduce a novel way of interacting with the system, and simply that alone has allowed them to uh, continue to be sold out. The other thing that's interesting to think about with the Nintendo Wii is that um, typically video game consoles are actually sold below cost, right? So the PlayStation, when it came out, cost Sony $600 to produce, but uh, they were, could only sell it for like $450. Nintendo's Wii cost $150 to produce, and they sold it for $250. By making this choice of not competing on uh, graphics and processing, but by competing on experience, that actually allowed them to uh, build something that was more cheap. It, it cost them less to build it, so they were making a profit immediately. They didn't have to wait for the for the games to make a profit. They were making a profit on the consoles. Okay, we actually have quite a few questions coming in. How have you managed the conflict between the marketing team view of the brand and the real customer view? So that's actually a really interesting comment. Um, and in some other talks, we talk about how the brand view of the world is very inside out. I am, you know, it's very much about a company trying to impress its brand on its customers. And what we're arguing is the experience view of the world is very uh, outside in. What do customers want to do, and how do you bring that into your organization? And what we um, try to do is, is there is a conflict there. I think it's best handled if it's handled as a kind of a creative tension. There's, it's not that, that that brand view is wrong. It's that it's not the only view that needs to be managed. And what you need to do is figure out how to balance who you are as a company and that, that, that DNA of who you are and, that, and, 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 and what you stand for, how to balance that with the experiences that people want to have and figure out ways to, to marry those. So um, uh, we talked about this financial services firm that we worked for. They had brand values. Their brand values were vast, uh, right, because they, they provide a lot of offerings, trustworthy. I mean, the, the kinds of things you would expect from a financial services firm. But what we heard from their customers is that they, don't, they didn't want to deal with a vast company. They didn't want to deal with a, a, um, even necessarily a knowledgeable company. They wanted um, an experience 
that was much simpler because financial services uh, tend finances tend to be quite complicated with lots of numbers and lots of rules. So they wanted a simple view. They wanted, um, they wanted a relationship. So very often financial services firms, especially online, are transaction oriented. It's all about buying and selling stocks or moving money around. And what these customers wanted was a relationship. They wanted to feel supported in their financial life. They didn't want to do, uh, 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 conduct a lot of transactions. They wanted to assess uh, how their money was doing already. And so uh, what, what we were able to do then is we were able to marry these brand values with these um, customer experience opportunities and deliver a product, deliver a service that, that, that met both, that supported this desire for people to assess how well they were doing while supporting the business in their, in their needs to uh, uh, make it clear that they had a lot of different offerings, a lot of different services, that they were vast and knowledgeable and all of those types of things. Um, let's see, what do we else do we have here? Uh, any recommendations on a book on how to conduct customer field research? Yes. Um, uh, 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 one of the best books on conducting customer field research, and I can say this, uh, uh, it's a bit of a plug for a former colleague of mine, a gentleman named Mike Kuniavsky. When he worked at Adaptive Path, he actually wrote a book called Observing the User Experience. And it's, a, it's an, almost a, it's like a, a textbook on uh, doing customer research. It does have focus groups in there because there are times that that's a, uh, important. But it also has usability and field research and surveys. Uh, one thing we haven't talked about at all here are, are, are you know, more quantitative methods, but we actually use those. There are times when those are, are, are helpful as well. So if you look for a book by Mike Kuniavsky, K-U-N-I-A-V-S-K-Y, called Observing the User Experience, uh, uh, that is an excellent field guide to customer research. And I think we'll take this as the last question from Arthur. How do you embed monitoring metrics in design to know when an experience needs to be revamped? That's actually an excellent question and, 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 and quite challenging. I mean, what you need to do, so it, it's easier on the web or with software because you can essentially instrument the, the website or the piece of software in such a way as when people engage in a certain behavior, you, you start logging them. There's actually a, a story from um, the Microsoft Office team. Uh, uh, if you've used Microsoft Office 2007, you know it's very different from Microsoft Office 2003 uh, because they decided to totally redo the user interface. And the person who was uh, leading that team, Jensen Harris, has spoken about how they were able to get to that point. And one of the things the Microsoft Office team did in 2003 is they actually instrumented the entire Microsoft Office suite. And um, they asked people, uh, uh, when they were using it, if it would be okay to um, log just kind of the mouse clicks and button clicks and what they did, the key presses, and send those to Microsoft. And enough people did that they got tens of millions of pieces of data. And they were able to use that data to figure out what needed to change in Microsoft two Office 2007. What were common uh, uh, key commands or sequential key presses or, you know, people tended to use this menu item and that menu item, but they were in two totally different parts of the system. Maybe they should be brought together. So they were able to use that data to drive design decisions uh, in the next rev. We are a big fan of, of using metrics to uh, kind of validate what you're doing uh, through experience design. Uh, you have to be careful that you don't start designing to the metrics because you might, you might lose sight of the right metrics. So if you think about the Kodak story, um, their metrics simply became profit margin. And what that meant was they did everything to op optimize their profit margin, which uh, was uh, their, be their biggest profit margins were in the, the photo paper that they used to print photos. And so when, they moved, when, they, when, when the rest of the industry moved from paper to digital, Kodak couldn't move there because their metric was so tied up to that to, to paper, they couldn't make the switch. And so you need to identify metrics that allow your organization to measure what is truly Im important to the organization, kind of um, um, regardless of the platform by which 
uh, those metrics are being driven because you'll find that sometimes uh, you'll, you'll need to use different channels of delivery to do different things. If you think about this financial services firm, financial services firms have a lot of metrics and a key number for any financial services firm is retention, right? They want to retain customers. What we realized though was that with our web channel, we couldn't actually, re uh, we didn't have as much of an impact on customer retention because everybody who worked with uh, our client had a financial advisor and it's those advisors that had the most control over retention. So it's not like um, E-Trade where your relationship is with the site and so the site is the main point of retention. With this customer, your, your primary relationship was with a, another human, a financial advisor. And if that financial advisor did something to piss you off or if you loved that financial advisor and they switched to another financial services provider, you were more likely to follow your advisor. So what that meant is we had to focus on the metrics that we thought the web channel, uh, uh, that, that we, we had to focus on the metrics that we thought the web channel could really deliver on, which was things like getting people to move more money into these accounts, making it easier to transfer money into existing accounts, making it easier to add new accounts. So if you have a brokerage account and you're buying and selling stocks, making it easier to uh, add a checking and savings account or to get a home mortgage. Uh, those were things that we recognized that the website could do and which were valuable for the organization. So um, metrics are important, but you have to figure out how to, how to use metrics intelligently to, to drive uh, experiences as opposed to use them to uh, kind of uh, try to force people to behave in ways that they're not interested in behaving. And I think with that, it's been over an hour, and I want to thank everybody for their attention, thank the people uh, in the chat uh, room for the uh, uh, the questions and comments, and to thank uh, Catherine for uh, hosting me. Thank you, Peter. We, it was a real pleasure to have you. And um, people that want to buy the book, you can buy it on the O'Reilly site, and you can also buy it from Amazon or your favorite book dealer. It's in stock right now. So um, thank you, and uh, it was a great presentation, Peter. All righty. Take care, everybody.